In this video, I'm talking to you about English language, paper two, section B, which is the persuasive writing section. And in particular, what's important to keep in mind is that I'm being very explicit about exactly what you need to do. Let's get started. ways of writing section. You can expect to see a statement. Underneath that statement, you will be given a persuasive task expressing your views about a statement. Now, your views is another way of saying your perspective, your opinion based on your experience with life. So any experiences that you've had with life, whether you've read about something, whether you've observed something in your own experience, whether you've seen something on the news, whether you've heard stories from your family or from a friend, all of those are going to contribute towards your views and your opinions. And this is measuring your ability to communicate those effectively. And there is an art to it, believe it or not. It's not just about spouting your views and hoping they come off well. People, people who do this really well have studied exactly what goes into enabling other people to listen and be persuaded. What to expect? You can expect to see a quote stating an opinion about something connected to the extracts you've read because everything will be based on one main topic. In the past, we've looked at cycling, about camping, holidays, uh, teenagers. It, everything will revolve around a major idea. Your goal is to persuade your audience to be convinced of your argument. You will first need to hook your audience. Then you establish your ethos and ensure your purpose is clear. I will do more breaking this down for you and a teacher model as well. Your ethos is your credibility. Why should I listen to you? Just like, why should you listen to me? Well, I'm a teacher. That doesn't always mean that you're going to listen to me. Uh, I'm a Senko. So I understand a little bit more perhaps about how learning works for neurodiverse students. That doesn't mean you'll listen to me. I'm a GCSE examiner, so I know exactly what the examiners look like. So that might help, although that might trigger in your brain that I'm very boring. I've been teaching for a long time, so maybe that will make me more credible, but maybe not. I'm doing a video, maybe that makes me more credible, or maybe not. It's a risk for teachers to do videos, right? But you need to find a way to help the audience think, yeah, I should listen to you. And it usually has to do with a story because we all like stories and it personalizes it and makes it relevant for you. And then after that, you need to make sure your purpose is clear. So for example, if I told you, I'm creating videos because I'm cr trying to create one more way to remove barriers for students who are struggling to achieve in the GCSE language, would that help? Would it help if I told you how hard I find it when I see students look hopeless about a task because even though it's been taught to them so many times, they haven't been able to access it? Would that make me more relevant? Would that make me better to listen to? Maybe, but it is always about the emotion. When it comes to English language, it's always about the tone. It's always about the emotion. And if we can get people on our side by the way we express our emotional experiences, we have persuaded. After you ensure your purpose is clear, you establish your ethos and you hook the audience with some repetition, a rhetorical question or three, and again, more on this later, you develop two to three main points connected to your argument. Now I say two to three because this is time allowing. You are in timed conditions. So you will have 45 to 50 minutes to complete this work. And in other videos, I do talk about the timings of the videos because that's really important, the timing of the exam, excuse me, because that's very important. Um, 
you have to be confident with how much time you have with each. And you have to come to the exam. I recommend you coming to the exam knowing how much time you can spend on each and cutting your losses and moving on otherwise. Because this is half of the marks for the paper. This is a quarter of the marks for your entire GCSE. You can't afford to have 20 minutes to complete it. You just can't. After you've developed two to three main points, you conclude by summarizing in a new way your argument. You need to remind your audience of what your argument is, what your opinion is, and then you leave the audience with a call to action. Now a call to action, we now see all over the place on social media, on our computers. Whenever it says click here, that's a call to action. And when you're writing something that's persuasive, a call to action can be something as small as an order to think a new way or a challenge to go out and donate or a challenge to try a different type of holiday or to go on a bike ride or to consider teenagers from a different light based on your arguments. So it can be as small as getting someone to think about something or getting someone to go and do something or address something differently. That's a call to action. That's your challenge to your audience based on your persuasion. Because we don't persuade for no reason. We always want someone to do or think something, right? That's our goal in persuasion. And it's important to plan your answer. You'll take about five minutes, at five to 10, some people say, I go with five, to plan your answer. You need to have a basic outline of that introductory statement with that thesis, which is your argument, which is your opinion. You need to know how you're going to divide it. What are your main points that support that opinion? And then what is your call to action. That should be planned so you know where you're going. I have 50 minutes on here, which is an optimal amount of time given exam conditions. Unless, of course, you qualify for extra time and then you need to recalculate your minutes based on how much time you have. Excuse me. Here's an example question. This is a task. A student said, adults these days simply don't understand teenagers. They're constantly trying to force us to do things their way, when really their way has created a broken world. Why should we listen to people responsible for so much sadness? Write an article for your local newspaper expressing your views about the comment above. Now, sometimes it'll take you a few readings to understand what the comment is saying, and it's worth rereading it to make sure you are clear with what this person's opinion is that you either agree with or disagree with because the student will always be stating their opinion, okay? And the first statement really highlights that. Adults these days don't understand teenagers, right? And if this is a problem and you're addressing adults and you agree with this, then your goal is to help adults understand and appreciate teenagers a little bit more than they do, okay? If you, if you disagree with it and you, if you think adults are pretty much spot on and it's teenagers that are getting it wrong, then that's fine too. You can write about either, okay? But the important thing is to know the quote, to, to know what the quote is telling you to do. So I always tell my students to path it, which means purpose, audience, and format. You need to get that very clear. This is an article for your local newspaper, right? So articles start with a title. It's an article, so you have a title. I always recommend make it alliterate if you can. So that would mean you're making the first letters of each word the same. So teenagers are a treat, not a trick. Treat us with more respect. That's not the best line, but again, we're not going for perfection here. This is exam conditions. We're going for the best that we can do. Now, if you do your title at the beginning and at the end, you've thought of a better one, all you have to do is cross it out and write a new one. A rhetorical question is always a nice one for a title. Are teenagers really to blame for the troubles of the world? 
right? Or are adults simply scapegoating teenagers because they know they got it wrong themselves, right? So a rhetorical question is really nice for a title. It's also really nice for the hook statement. The title can act as part of the hook here. It's a local newspaper, so you're speaking to adults and teenagers together. And this is about your view. So as I said before, this is about your vocabulary. I have a Quizlet set with 20 words in it. I recommend my students have at least eight to 10 words in their head. And when they come to the task, before they even read the task, they write those words down on the side and they aim to use all of them in the task because this will raise your grade by an entire mark or two because 16 of your marks are dedicated to vocabulary. So think about that. And these words are sophisticated words that can be used in lots of different situations when it comes to persuasion. And I'll talk about this in a different set. Then you need to begin appropriately. Dear so-and-so, if it's a letter, if it's an article, you have to have a title. If it's a speech, greet your audience. You need to break your ideas into paragraphs at the very least. That's so important. Don't get into a train of thought and not have any paragraphs. And if you don't, come back to it at the end and add the double slash because that will show that you intended to have a paragraph break and the examiner can give you credit for that. Use an anecdote towards the beginning of your speech or your piece, and I will go into this in an example video, but an anecdote is a short story because again, story makes us care. Use imperative sentences. An imperative sentence is an order. So for example, in your call to action at the end, tell your audience to think some way or do something. Tell your audience to consider this or picture this, colon. Right? It's a great way to add variation of sentence types. Consider ethos, pathos, and logos. So again, I will talk about this in another video, but your ethos is your credibility. Why should you be speaking and why should I listen to you? It's best established through emotional appeal, but also a little bit of logos, so your logic is really helpful as well. So for example, Part of my ethos is the fact that I'm a teacher. Teaching is in my very bones. Teaching is incredibly important to me, uh, which includes helping students learn. Now for you, if you're writing about teenagers or misunderstood, your ethos is simple. You're a teenager. Who would know about teenagers better than you? And that's all you have to state. Or you could talk about the fact that you've been a teenager for a few years. And whereas your parents might have been teenagers a long time ago, it's easy to forget. Just like you've forgotten part of what it's like to be a little child because you're not anymore. So you are a living, breathing teenager. Therefore, you know better than anyone else. That's a good argument. Your pathos is your emotive appeal, best established through the anecdotes, the short stories creating imagery in our heads so we can picture something that you're trying to help us understand so you can persuade us. And then the logic uh, are factual examples. So maybe things you know from the news or things you know from history or a statistic that you might know about something. I don't recommend making up lots of statistics because usually they sound unbelievable and it's not persuasive, it's not convincing. The challenge is to use one or two one sentence paragraphs. So in the middle of your main points, for example, if you wanna shock the reader with a statement that's strong or an order or a rhetorical question that stands out on its own, make it be its own paragraph. I will aim to do that in the teacher model. And the challenge, in your last main point, consider a different opinion and argue why it's a weak opinion. Don't make your main points be, well, one side of the argument is this, one side of the argument is this, but I believe this. That's not strong. You're not going to persuade people. You need to drive the piece by persuading us, convincing us that your argument is the best. Now, one way you could do that is by highlighting the other side and then smashing it to pieces. But make sure your purpose a basic outline, start by addressing the reader, write an introduction, hook the reader, show you care, finish this with your purpose statement, which is your argument about the topic, 
Develop your first reason for your argument. Include an anecdote with descriptive language. So for example, the use of a few adjectives to help us picture one example connected to this argument. Then you need to develop your second main reason for your argument. Include facts, anything specific you know to support your point. This is why teachers are always telling you to observe the world, watch the news, read, because you have more ideas when you've done that. If it's something from a TikTok video, fine, but make sure it's specific so we can understand. Develop your third main point if you have time. And you need to make sure you conclude. This is where you restate your argument in a new way. Ask a few rhetorical questions. Leave the audience with a call to action. What should they do or think with this new information that you've given them? Most importantly, if you haven't divided your ideas into paragraphs, you cannot score well. That's a simple change. Keep that in mind. Make your purpose clear in your first paragraph. Address the argument of the task. You get loads of marks for that. You include at least one anecdote about yourself. Even if you have to make it up, include an anecdote and make it specific and make it believable and make it connect to your argument. Hook the audience in the opening sentences, the rhetorical questions, maybe some repetition. Establish your ethos. So example, why should I listen to you? And it can be quite simple. Appeal to pathos by using lots of emotive language further in your writing. Emotive language can be as simple as, I felt horrible, terrible, hopeless, upset, right? It's those tone words and you can build them up. Include imagery in your anecdotes to help the audience picture the scene. If you can get a good metaphor going, brilliant. Include logical statements connected to your argument. Include a short, sharp sentence or two, and that can be one of those paragraphs that stand alone, like, I don't think so. That can be its own paragraph. Include a one-sentence paragraph. As I've just said, those can be put together. Include repetition. Repetition is so important. State your opinion, state it a new way, then state something about it. Again, repetition is important. Again, repetition is important. Did you see what I just did there? I used repetition to tell you that repetition mattered. Include lots of rhetorical questions. End with a call to action. And include some sophisticated vocabulary.